right, let's go ahead and begin with our week two lecture. Today we're going to be talking about American political thought and tradition. We're going to be talking about where our values of classical liberalism and where our political values today come from. And to do that, we need to go ahead and start at the very beginning of this kind of idea of classical liberalism and political thought. And then we're going to see how Americans have uniquely kind of changed the ideas of classical liberalism to fit their own political beliefs and their own political values, and what Americans have really made it into today in terms of American democracy. So, go ahead and begin here. Uh, where our ideas of classical liberalism really begin is with the Enlightenment and the ideas of about politics and the development of political thought during the Enlightenment. Many of our current views on political systems come from this Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment was a time during, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, during the 16th and 17th centuries when we really rethought uh, about how government should work. From the Age of Enlightenment comes the ideas of a constitutional government as well as the ideas of a republic. A constitutional government is just a type of government and a type of rule in which formal and effective limits are placed on the governmental power. Usually this is written out in, in terms of a in form of a constitution. We generally write out our, our rules about government and what the government can and can't do in the form of a constitution. And therefore we place formal and effective limits on this government. The government cannot do this, the government cannot do this. The government can do this, but only in this situation. Or the government can do this because it has the power to do that. You can think about how our Constitution often gives powers to certain powers to Congress, uh, but restricts Congress from making laws on religion or freedom, freedom of speech and things like that. So constitutions are very unique. They're unique documents because they give government power, but they also limit government power as well. And so during the Age of Enlightenment came this idea that we should really write out our constitutions. We should write out constitutions and place these formal limits on government through writing and that the, the uh, power of government really needs to be defined precisely. So that came out of the Age of Enlightenment, and also during the Age of Enlightenment we thought of this idea of a republic, and this is just, the republic is just uh, the idea that the, uh, the rule of law is paramount even over a majority rule. Uh, majorities, majority rule may come up with some crazy ideas. The majority, for example, may say that everyone needs to wear pink shirts today. But that's kind of a crazy idea. You can't get everyone to wear a pink shirt. We need to think about what the rule of law is and whether it's really in the Constitution and things like that. So that's the idea of a republic. And both of these came out of the Age of Enlightenment, when a time in which when we were really thinking about how governments should really function. Um, so, but even before the Age of Enlightenment, we were really thinking about placing limits on government through the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta, and I do care that you know this for your test, there will be a question about the Magna Carta on your test. The Magna Carta is the very first document ever written, it's a, it was the very first written charter that actually placed formal limits on a sovereign ruler by his subjects. So before the Magna Carta, many kings and, and rulers of lands and, and those that were in control of government didn't really have any limits on their power at all. They were free to do whatever they wanted and whatever they, want, whatever they wanted or whatever they said was the rule of law. The Magna Carta was one of the very first documents though, the very first written charter to place limits on a, on a sovereign ruler, and specifically, this was King John of England. And this happened way back in the 13th century, um, in 1209 um, up until 1215. And we're going to go ahead and talk about the Magna Carta and what exactly it was and why exactly it's so important to how we think about government today. So it started with the story of King John. King John was King King John was the ruler of England <coughs> um, in the early 13th century. And King John was, was the overall king. He saw, oversaw all the lands. But as with most nobility or in most um, aristocratic situations, King John had a number of feudal barons, people that would oversee his land, that would oversee the peasant farmers and make sure that the land was profitable and well managed and things like that. So King John hired these feudal barons, which were often close associates of his. But in 1209 to 1212, King John became really unpopular and a number of feudal barons actually really did not like his policies and how he was managing the country and so a number of feudal barons actually conspired against the king they had an idea that king john king john is doing all these nasty things for our country and really uh, hurting our economy and hurting our profits and things like that 
we're going to try to overthrow him. Uh, but King John really tried to appease his his feudal barons, and King John said, you know, hey, we have all this, all these bad things going on. Let's go ahead and try to uh, invade France and try to get some loot and some and win the war and win a war against France. It'll really boost morale, help our economy, and things like that. So the, nor the northern barons said, okay, we we can buy that. We can buy that. Uh, maybe we can profit from a war. So the northern barons funded King John's army um, to invade France and also to prevent a French invasion as well. Uh, there was, there's all, if you know anything about English and French history, there's a long-standing rivalry between the French and English in which they were consistently uh, invading one another. And so the northern barons funded King John's army to invade France but also to prevent a French invasion at that time. So in 2000, and that was in uh, 1213. King John was also uh, King John also during this time though to, in order to prevent the invasion from France and also to fund his wars elsewhere, King John raised taxes on the feudal barons. In order to raise an army, you have to have money, and where do you get that money from? Well, the nobility, the people that actually have money in the, in the system, the feudal barons. And so during this time, King John also raised taxes from the feudal barons, which any politician can tell you raising taxes is a very unpopular policy. King John raised these taxes to fund these unsuccessful wars and also uh, other questionable, questionable political in, uh, endeavors as well. So King John's wildly unpopular. He's raising taxes. He's fighting unsuccessful wars other where, other, where, other other places, and also the French are knocking on the door trying to invade as well. So King John's wildly unpopular. Feudal barons feel like they're overtaxed. And the feudal barons actually enter an open rebellion against the king. Uh, one of the very first massive widespread rebellions of the nobility against the king uh, in history. And so in 1215, these feudal barons open, open this, or enter into open rebellion. They refuse to pay the taxes and they challenge the authority of King John. King John always got his support and his money from the feudal barons. Well, the feudal barons are the ones that are, revolt, are, re, are rebelling right now. So they ha he has no sources of money. He has nowhere else to turn except for the Vatican, the papacy. Uh, the papacy was, was a very important political institution at that time, and they had a lot of money. The Catholic Church had a lot of money at this time. And so King John tried to turn to the papacy in order for financial mil military support. In exchange uh, for... In exchange for military services and financial services, King John swore that England would, would be a strict uh, Catholic nation, that they would swear loyalty to the papacy, and that they would try to help out the papacy in, in future uh, in exchange for uh, assistance now. And so King John uh, turned to the papacy to try, to try to get some assistance, but meanwhile the feudal barons are mounting their own rebellion, and in fact they're actually knocking on the door of London. While King John is trying to get support from the papacy, the feudal barons are knocking down, or kind of marching among, along the countryside, and they actually enter London. Well, with the feudal barons in open warfare right into London, King John has no other uh, options except to enter negotiations with the barons. And they entered, the barons entered London uh, in June of 2000, or sorry, of 1215, and King John signs what is now called the Magna Carta, on June 15th, 1215. So only a short five days uh, the negotiations were entered. King John was just basically signing this document in order to kind of get the war over with. He needs to focus on other things. He doesn't want to be overthrown. He likes to keep his power. So he just kind of does, he kind of goes along with this Magna Carta just to do it. Uh, but the Magna Carta is still a very important document because King John has to surrender to the feudal barons, which is one of the very first times that the uh, subjects, subjects of a king or king or queen, have actually kind of dominated a king or queen, and the king or queen has re has relinquished power to his subjects. And so, Magna Carta uh, is a very, very important document because it marks the first time that a king has has relinquished power to his subjects. But it also establishes the very first sort of Congress, or the very very first sort of legislature that ever in in modern times, I guess you should say. So it's very fundamental. Magna Carta is very fundamental to modern Republican democracy. Clause 61 sets up one of the very first Congresses called the House of Lords. Uh, the House of Lords uh, was a kind of a, a committee of 25 barons who could meet at any time 
to reject the king's decisions. If they felt that King John or other other monarchs in the future were stepping on the feudal barons' rights or overstepping their boundaries of power, these feudal barons could meet in the house of in what was called the House of Lords and reject the king's decisions. And the House of Lords still exists today. It's one of the two houses of Congress or the two houses of Parliament in, in the United Kingdom today. So the House of Lords was established in 1215. It still continues today. That's one reason why, that's another reason why it's very important. But setting up this very first legislature actually was one of the very first times that it gave a voice to the people, or at least the landowners um, in England. And nowadays we can kind of think of how Congress is supposed to represent the voice of the people, whether it does or not, whether you're cynical about that, that's completely fine. But the Magna Carta established at least a voice for these these landowning these, these landowning nobility, these feudal barons. And so King John had really clutched his power. He signed the document just to get it over with. The House of Lords is established. Uh, they now have a voice. They can now reject the king's decisions. But obviously, the king did not enjoy this at all. Uh, this was a threat to his power, his overall absolute power that many kings and queens had that day. So Clause 61 was immediately renounced uh, by both King John and the papacy. The papacy felt it was ridiculous that people had the people should have a voice and that the voice should really come from those that are in charge and those charged by God and those that were had divine right to the throne. Well, King John uh, signs this document to kind of regroup his troops. And as soon as he does that, as soon as he surrenders and he says, hey, you got your voice, go back to your land, King John mounts his own army again. And England is plummeted into a civil war over the Magna Carta. Uh, but as you can see here on the very bottom point here, King John died in 1216, almost immediately. Uh, the, uh, the Magna Carta was not in place for very long, and King John died in 1216. And with King, John death, King John's death, this ensured the future of the Magna Carta. And the reason why is because with the king dead, the new Henry III steps up. And Henry III uh, is only eight years old. <coughs> He's only eight years old at the time he ascends to the throne. And I don't know about you, but I really wouldn't want an eight-year-old commanding and commanding my army uh, or commanding a uh, civil war. And so the Magna Carta just kind of stands. Henry III says, or at least the nobility, or the voice of Henry III says, I'm too young to negotiate this political endeavor right now. We'll let the Magna Carta stand. You guys can reject any decision that I, as a eight-year-old to a young teenager, make. <laughs> so Henry III assumes the throne, <coughs> lets the Magna Carta stand. Henry III becomes of age uh, in 18, and sorry, in 1225 or 1226. And he lets, he signs the Magna Carta and therefore the Magna Carta stands. So King John signed the Magna Carta, which signified the first time that a, a ruler had relinquished power to his people. They established one of the very first Congresses, almost, if you want to think of it in that terms, one of the very first legislative bodies to oversee the rule of an executive. And then also they influence many modern Republican democracies in how they establish checks and balances sorts of systems on executives versus legislatures. So that's why the Magna Carta is so important. It happened in 1215, centuries before the Enlightenment, centuries before we thought about classical liberalism. They did this in England and they did this in the United Kingdom to ensure this system of check and balance, checks and balances on, monarch, on monarchs and kings and queens. So centuries beforehand, the United Kingdom is thinking about these sorts of things, and this is why it leads to the Age of Enlightenment. And I have here the Age of Reason and Enlightenment, whichever we want to call it. You can probably Google search both of those, Age of Reason or Age of Enlightenment, and they'll both come up. But it, the Age of Enlightenment was this idea in the 17th and 18th century. I would, I would even argue that um, it, a lot of it happened in the 16th century as well. But the Age of Reason and Enlightenment was this idea uh, that instead of whatever the monarch says or whatever the king and queen says, we should really look to reason, common sense, and virtue to, gu to guide our government instead of divine right or aristocratic power. If you are reasonable enough, you have enough common sense, you are virtuous, you believe in morality and things like that, then you are an individual, you have individual worth, and that should allow you to participate in government, to govern yourselves and to make decisions about the way your community or the way your 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 uh, 
your community or the way your kind of nation should go. You know, you can think about politics. You're a reasonable person. You can think about these things. You know right from wrong and, and those sorts of things. So that's the age of reason and enlightenment. And out of the age of reason and enlightenment comes, the, comes certain ideas about ideas, individual worth, uh, democracy, things like that. And the U.S. Is, the U.S. is actually founded on this class, this idea of classical liberalism. And remember, I, from last lecture, I told you the difference between liberalism with a small L and liberalism with a big L. This is liberalism with a small L. So, the U.S. is founded on this idea of classical liberalism, and it's indebted to John Locke and the social contract. We're going to talk about John Locke here in just a little bit, because John Locke is one of the most important thinkers. One of the most important thinkers that wrote on the idea of classical liberalism. So, but anyways. Classical liberalism embodies bodies individual liberty, where an individual has worth and dignity and can contribute to society. And individual liberty really contrasted with what was the old system of ro ro royal rule. You know, monarchy and hereditary privilege, just because you were born into power, you were able to rule. Whereas with with classical liberalism, just because you are an individual, you have the power to rule, not because you are part of some sort of royal family or royal lineage. Classical liberals also responded to aristocracy. Uh, no longer, just because just because you were poor doesn't mean that you couldn't think for yourself. And just because you didn't have money didn't mean you couldn't think for yourself. Whereas the aristocracy used to, it, the way it used to be with the aristocracy is if you were wealthy, you could, you could enjoy power. But really, uh, classical liberalism says, regardless of your financial status, you are worth, you have individual worth, and you can you can participate in government. And classical liberalism also didn't really like state-established churches. People were individual thinkers. People could think about religion however they wanted to, whether they believed or not, or whether they believed in this religion over this religion. Classical liberalism really addressed that and said, regardless of religion, you should be able to participate. And because you are a free thinker. You should be able to participate in whatever religion you want to as well. It also challenged irrational grounds for handling uh, over overpower, or for handing. Oh, sorry, challenged irrational grounds for handing over power uh, based on blood lineage or because of church's support. So once again, you can participate because you are an individual, not because you belong to a certain lineage or because you belong to a certain church. So classicalism is the idea that everyone has everyone has individual worth and dignity, and you just. In, because you are a free thinker, because you are a person yourself, you can think for yourself, think how you want to think, and participate in government regardless of, regardless of, of your wealth or your status in society. And this is what kind of embodies the U.S. today. And in, in the U.S., we really have this kind of distinct history that grows out of the Age of Enlightenment. The U.S. established itself right in the middle of the Enlightenment, or towards the tail end of the Enlightenment, I would say, on the latter half of the Enlightenment. So all these ideas from the Enlightenment were really floating around when the U.S. was establishing itself. Therefore, the U.S. really embraced democracy, embraced classical liberalism, and it also embraced the idea of a republic as well, where the rule of law is very important, but also democracy, where the voices of the people are very important too. So we have the voice of the people establishing what the rule should be, and then we should respect that rule and respect that voice of people. And that has really guided U.S. history for a long time. So let's go ahead and talk just a little bit about democracy. Democracy comes from the Greek word demos, meaning people, and then kraton, meaning rule. So when you put demos and kraton, or demo, demos and krat together, the people are ruling. Um, so you have people ruling. Now this could mean mob rule. And what I mean by that is you get a crazy mob together. You get enough people, uh, going back to my pink shirt, shirt, sh pink shirt example, you could have this crazy mob, uh, say, protesting right outside of Galveston College, saying everyone should wear pink shirts. And then that movement, the pink shirt movement, picks up and goes to the county courthouse. And the majority of Galvestonites are suddenly thinking everyone should wear pink shirts. And then people in, Gal people in Houston hear about it, and then people in Austin, and then people in, uh, people in Chicago, and people in Washington, D.C. You just have this crazy idea, this mob mentality of we need to stick together to ensure that everyone wears a pink shirt now. And this crazy mob with these crazy ideas riles up enough people and they overtake the government and they suddenly wearing pink shirts is now required at all times. And that's a crazy idea, but you can kind of see how because we're so connected nowadays and because people are connected, people like latching onto crazy ideas. 
that you could have this angry mob demanding people wear pink shirts Sunday. And so that's kind of democracy. Democracy is generally not as crazy as wearing pink shirts all day. But if you get enough people becoming crazy and joining this mob of pink shirt, uh, pink shirt advocates, then you could have a crazy idea such as that come to rule. But most people are, are, are tame enough not to, not to join in this mob mentality. But that being said, it could happen. So uh, at, the US, at the time of the founding, the U.S. Constitution emphasized a Republican form of democracy. No Republican with a small L, not Republican with a big L. Uh, and that just means they, idea, they embrace the idea of uh, respect of law, rule of law. And they also wanted a representative type, type of, of government as well. So going with respect of rule of law, they need, they need representatives to make laws, and then the citizens need to uh, sort of abide by those laws. So we wanted democracy, but we didn't want everyone participating in democracy, and we wanted some sort of representative type of government. So the US definition of democracy is generally majority rule with minority rights. What we want is we want the people to be heard, the people to be able to have their voices heard. And if they're in the majority, they should be able to get their law passed or their crazy idea passed. But that being said, we need to also protect minority rights. And we need to allow those that aren't in the majority to at least have a say or at least have some sort of voice or some sort of outlet for their ideas as well. You want this marketplace of ideas floating around. That's how government, when you have these free ideas floating around, that's when government tends to be the most productive. You can engage in, in productive dialogues. You can advance society through conversating with one or conversing with one another. And that really embodies the idea of democracy. That everyone has a say. Everyone can, can get their ideas out there. But whatever is in the majority should go. And if people are voting in the majority for a certain idea or a certain uh, belief, then that's what, sh that's what should be the rule of law. For, for the U.S. at that time. So the U.S. has a very unique kind of definition of democracy. I would say in contrast to, let's say, let's look at the United Kingdom with parliament, uh, just very briefly, parliament, whatever the majority is, they don't have any checks and balances. Parliament can pass these laws, pass these laws, pass these laws, no matter how crazy they are, just as long as the majority agrees with it and it becomes law. Whereas here in America, we allow, we allot time for the minor minority to at least debate and at least share their ideas. Whereas in England or in the United Kingdom, whatever's passed kind of goes. Whatever, whichever, whoever holds the, holds, the, holds the majority in parliament is allowed to pass whatever crazy bills they might come up with. So it's kind of a paradox that our system tries to protect both the majority and minor minority rights. We want everyone to have a say. And at many times, and especially we're going to see this play out throughout the semester, at many times it's, it's questionable whether the, minor, the minority actually does have those sorts of rights and whether their voices are really heard. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, some old, old philosophers. But we're going to go ahead and talk about specifically about Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. And Thomas Hobbes and John Locke contrasted one another in their view about the role of government and about the role of, and the rationality of people and things like that. But that being said, they both contributed to the United States' view on classical liberalism and what, what the individual's place in society is. So the United States' idea of democracy and the United States' idea of government really stemmed out of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, Thomas Hobbes first. Thomas Hobbes, he was an English, an English philosopher. He lived from 1588 to 1679, so a pretty lengthy time for, for someone living in that era. His most, most famous piece, I would say, is The Leviathan. He wrote this in 1651. And <clears throat> The Leviathan is named so because the title refers to this biblical sea monster, the Leviathan, who would be able to preserve order and liberty. And so you have this sea monster that sets out on the shore, and it embody, it's the embodiment of the government. It's symbolic of the government, is what he's trying to point out to. It's the sea monster that sets off on the sea, he lets people be. People on the shore can do as they wish, but if they get out of control, this sea monster, this Leviathan, will, you know, throw out one of his tentacles and punish the wrongdoer. That's kind of what the government's purpose is: is to punish, punish, punish people that do bad for society, and keep order, keep order uh, in society, and, and ensure that everyone has liberty. You're free to do it as long as you want, as long as you don't hurt, harm society. And Thomas Hobbes, he said in the state of nature, the state of nature meaning without the Leviathan, he said in the state of nature, if we don't have this Leviathan overseeing everything, that life will be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. 
And so what basically Thomas Hobbes, what he said is that if there is no government presence, then everyone will just kind of harm everyone. Everyone, will, everyone has the ability to kill everybody. Um, so Thomas Hobbes would say, if you looked over your shoulder right now, the reason why you're not worried about someone coming up and killing you is because the, the Leviathan, the government, is there uh, ensuring that you won't be harmed. And if someone did harm you, then they would, they would receive punishment from the Leviathan. So everyone is equal in the state of nature. Everyone can kill everybody. But with the government in place, everyone will abide by the law. Everyone will not commit crimes. Everyone will not commit murder. We know there's still a few cases of murder. But that being said, the government punishes those that do murder. So therefore, the Leviathan is still kind of working. Because all are equal, they are rivals for the necessities of life and fear each other and will fight to the death. But individuals that are so situated will sign away liberty to the sovereign, the Leviathan, the government, in order to ensure peace. So if we give away our rights, certain rights to the government, not all, not all rights, but if we give away certain rights and liberties to the government, the government will in turn ensure our protection. The Leviathan will, will sit out on the sea and punish the wrongdoers. We don't see the Leviathan, we don't see government all the time, but the government is still there, whether you want to think about it or not. And the government will punish those who do harm you, and that's why you feel comfortable in certain situations, because you know the government is there. All political decisions are made by the, the sovereign. The government, is, the government is the ultimate decider in these sorts of matters. And if power is not absolute, then society will collapse. So if the government does not have absolute power in protecting you, then society will once again collapse. If the government is not present, people will, will resort back to the state of nature and, and start killing each other for necessities. And so Leviathan, the Leviathan is very uh, pessimistic about the, the nature of people. He's very pessimistic about the state of nature. He thinks that we're all just kind of brutal animals to one another. But you can see how Thomas Hobbes has a very, at least valid point in the fact that, you know, walking down the street, I'm not completely worried uh, about being murdered. I mean, it still may be in the back of my head. But I know that if I am harmed, the government will step in and, and provide protection because I've at least given the government some power to do so. So, and also Thomas Hobbes um, also is very important in the fact that he really kind of shaped the way we think about government in the United States and, and the social contract, the exchange of, of we give away certain rights and liberties in exchange for the government protection. And that is very influential to political values and political culture here today in America. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Thomas Hobbes can be, be kind of confusing. We don't really hear a lot, a lot about him. We tend to hear about John Locke instead. So once again, if there's any questions, please consult the help discussion board or send me an email or otherwise. Um, Thomas Hobbes can be kind of confusing. I know when I took political thought years ago, he was, he was I thought he was fascinating, but that being said, he's also still very confusing. So if you have any questions, just let me know. And the one we hear about a lot, though, is John Locke. And John Locke kind of contrasted Thomas Hobbes in many ways. John Locke was also an English philosopher. He lived from 1632 to 1704, so there was some overlap, overlap between Locke and Hobbes. And John Locke authored a lot of philosophical pieces, but he authored the Two Treaties on Government. And in this uh, Two Treaties on Government, he really attacked the king's rule by divine right. He didn't think that the monarchy should be continued to be uh, filled by looking at divine right. So despite the Magna Carta in England centuries ago, many of the monarchs were still based on blood lineage and noble nobility and things like that. And John Locke really didn't like that idea that we should be filling our monarchy based on, uh, based on divine right. And John Locke thought that instead of, instead of looking at the monarch, we should look at individuals. He was really optimistic about the view of, of human behavior. Uh, he views the state of nature differently. He said that humans are naturally tolerant and reasonable beings. So if we're in the state of nature, there's no government yet, we're just in the state of nature, we're tolerant and reasonable beings. We know how to help out one another. But the government is established to protect our right to freedom and individual pursuits. The government is there just so that we can continue to pursue what we want to do in peace. Uh, you can think about how in the Declaration of Independence, we, we often cite life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That, off, that is actually attributed to John Locke. Uh, where I think it might be on the next slide here. No, it's not. Um, but 
The government is established to protect our, our right to freedom in individual pursuits. So instead of giving us protection, the government is just there to ensure that we can continue to do whatever we want to do and we can continue to do it peacefully and in a manner that is productive to society. Locke believed that when the government overstepped its powers, people should rebel. If the government is impeding on your right to do as you wish as an individual, then you should rebel against the government. And this is where the American American colonists and the Ameri well, many of the founding fathers, they really believed in John Locke. They believed that uh, when the government of England or the government of the United Kingdom was overstepping its powers, and according to John Locke, when the government oversteps its powers, the people should rebel. And the people, that's exactly what happened in America. They, America felt overtaxed and things like that. And so they, they thought that they're no longer able to pursue what they want to, so they need to rebel against the government. Uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about that a lot more when we talk about the Constitution next, next week. But just know that it's attributed to John Locke. Uh, so John Locke had a different view on government. He thought that people were, were very reasonable beings, very tolerant beings, and that the government should just be established to ensure that we can continue in that state of nature. So let's go ahead and look at a key difference. Uh, this is just kind of comparing and contrasting the two. Let's go ahead and look at Hobbes. Hobbes said that individuals have the right to everything prior to government. Without the government, we're free to do whatever we want to, and we can kill whoever we want to in order to get the resources we need to survive. And Hobbes also thought that people were naturally greedy, so in the state of nature, they were going to steal and they were going to kill each other for resources. When, But people don't want to live in fear all the time. They don't want to live in fear of dying. They don't want to live in fear of crime and things like that all the time. So Hobbes argued that people will give up all rights once the government is established in exchange for security, in exchange for not being hunted, <laughs> basically. Whereas Locke, uh, Locke says individuals have a right to what they labor for. As long as they're working for it, as long as they're happy, and as long as they're laboring for what they want, then that's good enough in the state of nature. People do not give up all rights in society. They only give up some uh, in exchange for protection. And the government is, in, the government is there to protect uh, the right to life, liberty, and property. There we go. I guess it is on this slide. Government is established just to ensure that we can continue to do as we please. Uh, we should think for ourselves. We should continue to do as we want to and resort to the government only if that is threatened. Life, liberty, and property often translated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, you can maybe think how property translates into happiness. I'll let you guys go ahead and, and discuss that amongst yourselves. But the government is there to protect those rights. So Hobbes and Locke, uh, two very different philosophers, both uh, English philosophers, though, and both really contributed to this idea of, of classical liberalism and also contributes to the way we in America view government today. So we're still viewing government, we're still arguing over the role of government today, whether we should establish more welfare programs or whether we should regulate same-sex marriage or whether, uh, you know, in terms of abortion or in terms of marijuana legalization, any of these hot-button hot topics are still discussing the idea of what government should do. And, the, and that's because we as individuals can think about these sorts of things. We're rational actors. Human beings are thought to be rational actors. We want to, we want to surround ourselves with the way we think the world should be, and we want to influence the government and to reflect the way we think the world should be. So human beings are rational actors and who make decisions based on cost and benefits. Human beings are analyzing costs and benefits, or do we give the government more power because it'll be a benefit, or do we give the government less power because it'll be a cost, uh, or will giving the government less power be a cost, and things like that. We always analyze everything in, on, in terms of costs and benefits. Um, you can think about, uh, let's say even watching this lecture video, is it worth the cost of listening to, listening to me lecture for an hour or so? Is it worth the cost to do that in, in, in order to get the benefit of more knowledge and be prepared for the test and get a better grade? Or do you want to eschew watching this video and take the risk of, uh, or take the risk of it costing you your grade? So we weigh, we weigh everything in terms of cost and benefits. Um, we always think about different situations in terms of cost and benefits. Human beings are naturally utility maximizers, though. And what I mean by this is that we really want the greatest good, uh, we want the greatest amount of good or happiness for the least amount of cost. So if the costs are too high, we're not going to do this. If listening to me lecture for so long is such a high cost, 
we're not going to do it. There's better things to do with your time. And I'm not going to lie, there probably are better things to do with your time than listen to me lecture. But that's an idea of utility maximization. It's worth the cost to listen to me lecture because it'll provide the greatest amount of good or happiness when I get that really good grade on the test. Utility maximization is really what we do on a consistent basis. Um, we think about how much is it going to do for me? What's in it for me? And how can I spend the least amount of time or the, have the least amount of money in order to get the greatest amount of good? Um, and that will definitely be on your test, the idea of utility maximization. So I hope I'm explaining it uh, good enough for you. Just think about anything in life. Think about decisions you make on a daily basis. How can I get the greatest amount of good for the least amount of cost? Um, I guess, sorry, just one more example. I guess I'll try, I'm trying to explain this as well as I can. But utility maximization um, would be if you're ordering at a restaurant. You want the best dish possible for maybe the least amount. So maybe when you're looking at a menu, you're going to look at the prices. And you want, the, you, want a good tasting, you want a good tasting meal, and you want it to be filling, but you don't want to spend a whole lot on it. And that's, uh, that's kind of an idea of utility maximization, weighing the cost and benefits. How much is it going to cost me versus how much am I going to be, feel satisfied? And this all comes from the assumption of rationality. So the assumption of rationality just assumes that people structure their preferences and make calculations based on rational ordering their preferences. How do we decide to order our preferences? What, why is this certain, why is a hamburger greater than a chicken sandwich? And then, are mistakes really errors in rationality or just errors in information? Maybe we didn't have that information that the hamburger had a condiment that we really didn't like, whereas the chicken had no condiments and it was really, really good. We, we, is that an error in rationality? Did we really, we, did we really, was there really a flaw in our rationality or was it just an error that we didn't have all the information about what that hamburger was versus that chicken sandwich? I hope that's, I, sorry, that's probably a really bad example. But if there's any questions on this stuff, just please, please email me. Um, also, we're not always rational. We don't always utility maximize. Uh, you can maybe think about uh, a boyfriend or a girlfriend in the past that wasn't the greatest choice for you. Um, but at that time, given the information that you had and the way you were feeling about that, that person was, was right for you and it felt right. And, but looking back, maybe hindsight's twenty twenty, and it's not really, not really that great and it's considered a mistake. It might just be an error in your rationality or it's an error in information. You didn't really know that person as well as you, as you thought you did. So we utility maximize on everything with our relationships, with our food choices, with going to class, uh, with jobs things like that. We always think about costs and benefits and what's going to be the best for me and allows me to be the laziest, basically. So that's the idea of utility utility maximization. All right. So that's how we think as human, as political animals today. Uh, it translates into our politics as well. When we think about candidates, who's going to be the best for me? Uh, and then is it worth it voting and things like that. All right. So that's, uh, that's enough about political thought and how we kind of think about things and how we approach things in terms of political values and beliefs today. Let's go ahead and talk about our democracy here in America. We need to know about, we need to know about political thought and democracy and how we might approach different types of democracy before we can really delve into what the US, U, what the US is and what the US government is. There's really two types of democracy. There's direct democracy versus representative democracy. And notably, we do have both forms of democracy here in America today. Uh, direct democracy is just individual citizens vote directly on all laws and policies. So we don't have a pure, we don't have a pure direct democracy. We don't have a very, uh, we don't have direct, direct, direct democracy in the purest sense. We don't, not all individual citizens vote on all laws and policies, but there are at least examples of direct democracy. And we're going to go ahead and talk about that here in just a little bit. Opposite of direct, direct, direct democracy is the representative democracy, and this is the one we often think about here in America. Because here in America, we don't go to Washington, D.C. to vote on all laws and policies. That would be crazy to get all 300 million United States citizens to go to Washington, D.C., vote on a bill, go home, and then, hey, tomorrow a new bill came up, we need to go back to Washington, D.C. Instead, we have a representative form of democracy, and we elect officials to make decisions uh, on our behalf. And people and eligible voters decide who gets elected to make these decisions for our, our, our for the public at large. So here in Galveston, we have our own Congress member. We elected him to go represent us, represent our views, and 
uh, to vote on certain laws and policies. Instead of us traveling to Washington, D.C., rather we elected him to send him to Washington, D.C. to vote for us. Uh, I have here that the U.S. has representative democracy because largely we do. Uh, representative democracy is the most common form of democracy here in America, and it's what we do every two, every two years when we, we elect our House of Representative members, when we elect our U.S. Senators, when we elect the President every four years. We want them to represent our views and to represent the, the views of the majority, or at least the majority of those who vote. So let's go ahead and talk about certain examples of direct democracy here in America. Uh, direct democracy is very limited here in America. It's not often that all citizens vote on policies and issues, but there are still uh, examples and one and two examples of this would be initiatives and represented and initiatives and referenda. Sorry, excuse me. Initiatives and referenda. These are types of ordinary citizen involvement, and they tend to only happen at the state and local level. So you'll have initiatives and referendum at the state and local level. And I'll try to give you an, an, an example of this. An initiative, though. An initiative is where registered voters, uh, they get together, maybe this is just an idea in the community, and the registered voters will work on a policy putting forward citizen laws directly to the ballot. So these registered voters will talk to each other, they'll draft legislation, and they'll get enough signatures, uh, and then it will be on the ballot in the next November. So if enough voters in a particular community, uh, there is a percentage set by law according to each community, but if enough voters, a certain percentage of voters, sign this petition, the initiative appears on the ballot in the next general election. So voters, the community will have this idea, there will people organize this thing, organize these things, they'll go out and they'll try to get people to sign this petition to, in order to at, least, to at least get the question on the next ballot. Uh, and then if it is, then it'll appear in the next general election, and then the next general election it will be approved by a, at least a 50% vote. If 50% of people agree with the, the question on the ballot, it will pass. 21 states use this. And the most, probably the most famous example of this would be Colorado and legalizing marijuana. Uh, Colorado, enough citizens in Colorado believed that marijuana should be legal, at least uh, recre for recreational and medicinal use. So Colorado uh, organized this drive. People went door to door in Colorado, tried to get people to at least sign the petition so that the question, so that the question of legalized recreational marijuana and medicinal marijuana would at least be on the ballot. And then in November 2012, when Colorado voters went to the ballot box, the, they saw the question on the ballot of whether marijuana should be legalized for recreational and medicinal use, and 50, at least the majority of Colorado voters agreed that legalized uh, marijuana should be legalized for both recreational and medicinal use. And that's an idea of an initiative. Registered voters, ordinary people in the community, got this drive together, got the petition together, went door to door, had enough people sign the petition so that the question could appear on the ballot, and then they either approved or denied the question at hand. For Colorado, they legalized marijuana in 2012. We now have four states with legalized recreational marijuana, and most of them have done this by the initiative method. Now, 21 states use this. Um, <clears throat> the other the other states usually, um, or at least 15 of them, I guess I should say, I have the note 15. Uh, other states use a kind of a mix of the initiative and referendum. But referendum differs from initiative slightly. A referendum is similar, but the referendum comes from the state or local government and then goes to the voters. Um, so the note here uh, can also put it on the ballot as an amendment in some states. Um, so referendum is a petition signed by, refer by registered voters. The, once again, you have the percentage required set by law for a legislative action to be put on the ballot, uh, or sorry, to be put on ballot for a vote. So registered voters will say, we really care about, I'll once again use legalized marijuana. So the voters will put this referendum on the, or will go door to door, try to get people to sign this ballot saying, hey, we really care about legalized marijuana. The registered, the people that organize this drive will take the petition to say a legislative member or maybe even the governor. And then the governor or that legislator will draft legislation. And then that, le that piece of legislation will actually be on the ballot for people to vote for. So kind of the same, uh, referendum requires less voter participation or less community participation and much more of work on, much more work on the, in the hands of the government. 
or at least people that work in government. So it's still kind of the same thing, though, that it will be on the ballot and people can vote on it. About 15 states use this referendum procedure, and the example would be Ohio. Uh, enough people in Ohio signed the petition that, say, that said basically, hey, we want medicinal marijuana legalized. And Ohio, uh, Ohioans got the petition together, people signed it, they gave it to some sort of person in government, whether that be maybe a member of the legislature or maybe even the governor. They drafted that legislation, they put it on the ballot, and Ohio actually um, did, not, did not approve legalized marijuana for medicinal use in their state. Uh, I hope I'm clear between the difference between referendum and initiative, but you can see how it's direct democracy. Citizens are voting directly on this piece of legislation. Uh, you can probably think that there's probably different term, there's different types of topics that are covered by this, but initiatives and referenda are ways for voters to really vote yes or no on particular issues. And so that's just an idea of direct democracy here in America. We don't have widespread direct democracy, but there's still these little pockets of direct democracy when you see an initiative or a referendum on a ballot. Rather in America, we really emphasize representative democracy. We elect officials who make decisions for the public. And this is Locke's social contract in action. It says, hey, I'm going to give the government power. I'm going to give you power to represent me. That way I'm free to pursue my life, liber uh, you know, to seek out life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We give the government power to do things. As long as it doesn't impede on us, we don't really care. We want to be able to pursue our own hobbies, our own interests, our own whatever we want to do. And we'll let the government be over here to the side so that we can do those sorts of things. So this is Locke's social contract in, our, in action. We allow the government to exist as long as the government allows us to exist and do whatever we want to. Representative democracy was really established by the founders and guarantees a republican form of government, meaning representative form of government. And representative democracy really tries to eliminate mob rule. So what I mean by that is that uh, we, while you know, we don't get all the people saying we want pink shirts, actually voting to make pink, sh to make pink shirts a new law, we get these representatives. These representatives are kind of a stopgap measure for mob rule. Mob rule can't really take off when all these people that are in the mob don't actually have a voice in government. They don't actually vote in government. So it eliminates mob rules, um, but that being said, officials themselves, officials in Congress, could be a mob of themselves because they can vote. They, the legislature, the legislative, or sorry, the Congress member from Galveston can influence the Congress member from Houston, which can influence the Congre Congress member from Chicago, which can influence the Congress member from Vermont, things like that. And so officials aren't really held accountable. You could create a mob in Congress, and in many ways we have because of this split ideology, this this non or this norm of very little debate going on that's happening right now. There's sort of this mob. Whoever controls Congress controls everything, and, and they're kind of a mob together. Um, but officials are held accountable by regular elections and procedures for removal. We can remove members of Congress if they if they get too crazy, if they if they get too crazy in their mob, and we can vote them out too through regular elections, which doesn't really happen. We're going to talk about that when we talk to talk about Congress. But officials are at least held accountable somewhat by regular elections and procedures. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about a recall election. Uh, this is kind of a way that officials are held accountable, and I really do care that you know this. A recall election is used to have officials removed, and so we can hold officials accountable if we don't really agree with them. And with a recall election, uh, voters sign petitions. You must have a certain percentage uh, set by the state. And voters will sign these petitions saying, hey, this guy is doing a really bad job. He's part of that mob mentality. He's not being held accountable. He's kind of on a rampage right now. We need to remove him from office. And this is so a special election where voters decide by a simple majority. And the most famous example of this is the Wisconsin re recall. And if you have an opportunity, I'd, I would encourage you to at least kind of look up the re Wisconsin recall, maybe click on this link and, and look at it. But in Wisconsin, you had Scott Walker. Scott Walker was the governor of Wisconsin, and he plummeted Wisconsin into debt. Job growth was really slow. The economy was really bad. People thought Walker was doing a bad job. Um, and so Wisconsinites, I think they're Wisconsinites, I believe, um, decided to hold Scott Walker accountable. And they signed the petition to remove Scott Walker from office. Scott Walker faced a recall election. Scott Walker was a Republican, and so the Democrats held their own candidate, 
and they actually held this little recall election and ends up Scott Walker wasn't as unpopular as Wisconsinites thought. Wisconsin, uh, Scott Walker won his recall election. But that being said, it was a way to at least hold Scott Walker accountable. He had to address the issue on his campaign trail. He had to campaign and say why he was actually why he was actually doing a good job. So he had to justify his actions to the citizens and was held accountable for his actions in office. So it's just an idea of a recall election. It's just an idea that we need to have officials that represent our views and we need to make sure that they're doing the right thing and allowing us and not while also not impeding on our rights. So that's an idea of representative democracy and recall elections really embody representative democracy in many ways. Uh, all, I guess really all sorts of elections embrace uh, representative democracy in many ways. So hopefully that was, uh, hopefully that was a good explanation. All right. So we have direct versus direct, direct versus uh, representative democracy. Now we need to actually think about like what democracy is, and we know the different types. But how do we measure it? Remember when we talked about empirical political science? We need to learn how to. We need to figure out how to measure it, and to make sure that we can measure it in a way that shows that these trends or this these things are happening. And democracy is very tricky. Democracy is can be many things all at once. And so getting a grasp on what democracy is is very, very difficult. So I'm at least gonna to try to give you three different types of, of ways to measure democracy. And the very first one comes from Carl Cohen. Carl Cohen uh, was a very famous political scientist and he thought of democracy in three different ways. He thought that democracy had three different dimensions to it. And these were breadth, range, and depth. And I guarantee there's gonna be a question about Carl Cohen on your test. And the question will be something like, how did Carl Cohen measure democracy? And the answer would be breadth, range, and depth. So Carl Cohen saw democracy in terms of breadth. Let's go ahead and tackle that one. He said, there needs to be a breadth of democracy. And what I mean by that is there needs to be a fraction of the citizenry actually participating in political decision-making. This, this obviously varies according to the type of participation, voting, holding an office, et cetera. But we need to have citizen partic participation, at least some sort of fraction of the citizenry, if not all of the citizens, need to participate in political decision making. So we need, in order to have democracy, you need to have a breadth of democracy, and then you need to measure what exact, what fraction of the citizenry participates in political decision making. Uh, for full democracy, you would have 100% of the citizenry participating in, in political decision making. Unfortunately, not often, you don't find that very often. And here in America, only about 25% of people actually vote, and even only four, only 535 people participate in Congress compared to the 300 million people that live in America. So a very, very small fraction of, of citizens actually participate in democracy here in America, so much so that America is kind of losing its, could honestly be kind of losing its idea of democracy or at least being defined as a democracy. Now, Carl Cohen also looked at range of democracy. He said you need to measure the range of democracy. And what he means by that is that there needs to be an array of issues and decisions over which the public exercises decisions. The public needs to be aware of issues, and if you can measure how, how aware of these issues they are and how they actually feel about them and how they're able to make decisions over these issues, then you can have a successful democracy. Uh, unfortunately, here in America, we don't really really discuss an array of issues as a public. In public, we don't uh, we don't make decisions over a, a wide array of issues. In fact, we leave that largely to the only 535 people that represent us in Congress. And so therefore, that's another reason why, according to Carl Cohen's de definition of democracy, U.S. may not actually be a true democracy. Um, obviously, this varies according to issue, economic, social, et cetera. Uh, I would say that definitely referendum and initiatives tend to deal with economic issues, and so the public exercises certain decision-making powers over those sorts of things, not necessarily social issues, though. Uh, and then third, Carl Cohen said you also need to measure the depth of democracy. And what he means by this is the potential to influence decisions and the autonomy of popular participation. He said that he said that all in order to have a true democracy, citizens need to actually be able to influence decisions. And this is another reason, this is once again another reason, according to Carl Cohen, that the U.S. may not have a really good system of democracy. We don't have a, we don't, we as citizens have very little influence over decisions. And the part popular participation really isn't that autonomous. Uh, we don't, 
select of we don't select of uh, select a lot of leaders, and we don't really participate autonomously in a lot of decision makings. Instead, we leave that up to our representatives. The once again, I hate to keep saying it, but the 535 people that work in Congress. So really, those 535 people representing 300 million people, democracy is not really that prevalent. I mean, we get little seeds of democracy at the state and local levels and things like that. But in terms of U.S. government, since this is the U.S. government course, the by Carl Cohen's definition of democracy or measurement of democracy, democracy is not really that prevalent here in America. Now, that being said, we're still a lot more democratic than other nations, uh, but we're certainly not anywhere near the true definition of democracy, I would say. But Carl Cohen is one way to measure democracy. Another way, there's three ways, would be Samuel Huntington. Samuel Huntington was a lot more simple than Carl Cohen. He just kind of looked at elections rather than the actual decision making that goes on and the policies that actually matter day to day. Like Carl Cohen did, Samuel Huntington said, hey, we just need to look at elections. Democracies are democracies if we can analyze these two dimensions. And so we have Samuel Huntington questioned how are decision makers selected? And he really analyzed whether systems are becoming more or less democratic based on their elections. The true essence of a democracy for Samuel Huntington was, was elections, not the decision making like it was with Carl Cohen. He said, Samuel Huntington was very simple. He said, one, are elections fairly contested and what is the degree of competition? So do you have, do you have a competitive election with at least two candidates vying for the same office? And are they fairly contested? So are the rules of the game set so that no one can cheat, no one can rig the system, and, does, and is it a fairly competitive election? And then Samuel Huntington also said, two, are people allowed to participate in elections in a fair and open manner? So that means, and what, are, what, is the type, what is the type and degree of participation, including the opposition? So what Samuel Huntington said was, we need to look at the elections and we need to, we need to see if people are allowed to express their views or express who they support in that election. So Samuel Huntington uh, would look at, say, let's look at China. China has elections. They do have elections. They're a communist system, but they do have elections. Unfortunately, they don't really meet Samuel Huntington's idea of democracy, though. Elections in China are not fairly contested. There's often only one candidate on the ballot, there's, so there's very little competition. And any people that dissent or express some dissension or at least disagreement with the Chinese government or at least the person running in the election is often meets punishment. I would, I would say execution probably, but it also often meets some sort of punishment. So people, people aren't allowed to participate in elections in a fair and open manner. Instead, that there has to be uh, the, any opposition is, is really repressed. So I would say by Samuel Huntington's definition, the U.S. actually has a high degree of a high degree of democracy. If you measure democracy in terms of Samuel Huntington's view, democracy is very prevalent here in America. We have we have elections that are at least fairly contested. You have, I mean, often you only have two candidates, but at least you have two options. In some in some elections, you do have three options. I would say independents independents make a big splash in elections every now and then. And then also people are allowed to participate in elections in a fair and open manner here in America as well. We're allowed to express whether we support the Republican or Democratic candidate. We're allowed to put yard signs up. We're allowed to wear buttons and bumper stickers and things like that. So by Samuel Huntington's definition, we do have a lot of, a lot of democracy because of, we have, because of the elector election system that we have in America. Now, after the election system is over and we looked at Carl Cohen's definition of democracy, then the U.S. definition of democracy in terms of how we can decide issues and who gets to participate on, on deciding issues and things like that. Democracy kind of diminishes them. But uh, at least by Samuel Huntington, we, we have an optimistic hope for democracy. And then we look at Freedom House's definition of democracy. And by Freedom House, uh, I would definitely say that the United States tends to be a, a, a ranked pretty highly on the scale of democracy. So Freedom House is an organization, they're an international organization that is dedicated to studying elections in different uh, in different countries. They're also dedicated to studying the amounts of political rights and things like that in different countries. So they're an international organization, they're a nonprofit organization that just tends to monitor countries and make sure that they're promoting democracy in certain ways. Freedom House looks at these different countries and measures freedom, freedom in two broad categories. The first one is political rights. Freedom House looks at political rights and political rights just says that that country at least allows people to participate freely in the political process 
including the right or ability to do these four things here. To vote freely for alternatives in legitimate elections, to compete for public office, to join political parties and organizations, and to elect representatives who have a dec decisive impact on public policies and who are accountable to the electorate. So by Freedom, by Freedom House's definition, we're actually pretty democratic. We have a lot of political rights here in America. We've definitely fought through different social movements and through the centuries to be able to, or to grant political rights to new, to new sectors of society. Uh, you can think about uh, the, the women's movement in the early 19th century, and then you can also think about uh, the civil rights movement for the blacks and African Americans for their political rights. And largely here in America, we're allowed to do these four things here. We're allowed to vote freely for alternatives. We're allowed to choose between Democrats and Republicans and legitimate elections, not rigged elections, although some would say the amount of money going into elections nowadays may have rigged the system, but they're still legitimate elections. One person, one vote, and we're allowed to vote freely for whoever we choose. We're also allowed to compete for public office. If you want to get into politics, you can get into politics. You might have to work your way up, and it might be a long process, but if you want to compete for public office, you can at least try to do that at some local level or maybe even a county, le a county level, things like that. We're allowed to join political parties here in America and organizations. You can think about many colleges have different types of political organizations, young Democrats, young Republicans. There's uh, Republican, there's public wi Republican women organizations, there's Democratic women organizations. There's different or political organizations that we can join. And we're also allowed to join political parties. Uh, here in, in most states, you actually register for a political party. Here in, here in Texas, it's just a little bit different. But you can still identify with that political party. And here in America, also, we have political rights to elect representatives who have a decisive impact on public policies. Carl Cohen, on the, on the other hand, would say that we need to participate and we actually need to be the ones voting. Well, by Freedom House, you just need to at least elect representatives that at least have some sort of impact on public policies, and they often do. And we also, in order to ensure political rights, we need to at least hold, hold, our, elector, or hold our elected officials somewhat accountable. You need to be accountable to us. And in some ways, sorry, in some ways, they really are. Um, Freedom House also looks at civil liberties. And civil liberties are just really, the, they just really allow for the freedom of expression and belief, associational and organizational rights, rule of law, and personal autonomy without interference from the state. So this is kind of similar to political rights, but civil liberties just says uh, we need to be able to express ourselves. You can often think about this in terms of our, our First Amendment here in America. We need to just have the freedom to express ourselves and associate freely, uh, to organize freely, and we need to be able to do it without the state interfering. So Freedom House would probably look at the United States and say they have a high level of democracy. They, they grant political rights to their citizens, their citizens are allowed to vote, and they're allowed to, to freely express themselves. You can, going back to my example of China, in China you can't really do these sorts of things. You can't really vote for alternatives because there's only one party. Uh, you can't really compete for public office because the party controls who gets to be in public office. And you can't really associate or organize, organize with people that may have the same political beliefs as you. You may be able to do it secretly, but you can't do it freely and openly like, like Freedom House would, would like. You know? So these sorts of ways, uh, these are all different ways to re represent democracy. I would say Carl Cohen is much more strict. Carl Cohen believes in traditional uh, direct democracy. He thinks that you need to be able to participate on issues and decision making. Samuel Huntington relaxes it just a little bit and says, hey, we need to just look at elections. And then Freedom House looks at everything. Uh, he says, Freedom House, or Freedom House says even beyond elections, people need to be able to express themselves at all times about the government. The government, the politics and government is an ongoing process, and so people need to be able to hold the government accountable at all times, express themselves at all times, and be able to uh, be able to associate and organize freely. So however strict your definition of democracy really is, you can find a definitely a, a measurement or a way to measure democracy according to, according to your, what you believe democracy should be or what you believe democracy should be, what your definition of democracy is. But these are all different, three, three, three different ways to think about democracy and how to define it and measure it as empirical political scientists. It's still very difficult. And we're still working on it, I, I would say, as political scientists. So let's go ahead and talk about your discussion board questions. These are your discussion board questions for the week. And hopefully I addressed most of these in the lecture. Uh, first one here is I just want you to do an internet search for Magna Carta Clause 61. 
uh, go ahead and put that into Google, and I, I look at the second link uh, on that Google search. I really like that second link on that Google search. But I want you to at least kind of read up just, just a little bit. Just spend 10 minutes reading through what the Magna Carta Clause 61 was and how it really influenced the way that we view the role of government and we view the role of the citizens' participation in government through Magna Carta Clause 61, which was established centuries before the Age of Enlightenment. I want you to look at that, and then I want you to I want you to answer the question: What other documents sound similar to Clause 61? I will give you a hint: It is one of the founding documents of the United States, and it really sounds very oddly similar to Magna Carta Clause 61. Uh, second one here: I just want you to review the slides on direct versus representative democracy. I, I know I kind of tripped up there, and I may not have been as clear as I'd have liked to been. So just review those slides really quick, and I want you to answer the question. Do you believe that direct democracy could work today? So let's say America had uh, America America had a system of direct democracy, and all citizens voted on all issues. Do you think that could work somehow today? Could we do an internet survey or send a daily email out with the policy issues of the day, and people would kind of research them and vote on them? Could that work today? Uh, what crazy ideas could you come up with that would actually make that work? Uh, do you believe that if we did so, there would actually be a higher voter turnout? And do you believe that people would actually care about politics more? I want you to also consider your answer from last week. Many of you were cynical about why people are turned off by politics, and it's completely understandable. I completely understand that. A lot of people are. That's exactly why I answered. That's exactly why I asked that question. But consider your answer from last week as to why people are turned off by politics. And then think about if we did have direct, direct democracy, do you think let do you think more people would actually be less turned off turned off by politics. Do you think there would be more participation in politics if they were allowed to actually have a say on issues? And then finally, the third one here is, which do you think is the best way to measure democracy? Looking at those three definitions, uh, Carl Cohen, Samuel Huntington's, and Freedom Houses, which do you think is the best way to measure democracy? Is there an actual best way to define democracy? Go ahead and try to define democracy in your own terms and think of a way to measure it. How do you know democracy when you see it? Um, so consider those, consider those things and consider your own definition of democracy and which one it kind of aligns with. So those are your discussion board questions for the week. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this. Uh, next week we're going to be talking about the Constitution, so there'll be a lot of history and kind of a history lesson for you uh, just a little bit. But we're going to go ahead and talk about that. Once again, if you have any uh, questions, anything you need help with, there's the help discussion board. You have my email. You, I'm also on Skype. And you also have my phone as well, whatever you need. Please get a hold of me if you have any questions at all. So I hope you have a good rest of the week. Uh, be sure to post your discussion board, and I will see you next week.